Hi, my name's Dr. Lila Landowski, and today we'll be talking about vomiting or emesis, especially the vomiting reflex pathway. Now, normally the stomach is going to be emptying its contents down into the duodenum, right? But when you vomit, it essentially gets forcibly evacuated up through your esophagus and out through your mouth. So it's a pretty unpleasant experience, but it actually serves a really important purpose. So if you're able to rapidly remove the contents of your stomach, you can get rid of um, a potential toxin, for example. Um, it allows you to do that without having to wait for that, um, whatever it is, to pass all the way through your digestive tract, potentially doing damage on the way through, right? So it's um, a very useful, advantageous process, um, and it helps us really survive. Okay, so what actually happens during the vomiting reflex? Now, I'm not going to make you watch um, any gross videos because uh, personally, emesis is my nemesis and I can't, I can't handle uh, bodily fluids. But I mean, cat videos, right? Little guy. So the vomiting center is in your brain stem. Um, deep in there in a region called the medulla and it's not really a defined center because it's actually a network of central pattern generators but for all intents and purposes um, we call it the vomiting center because it is controlling that reflex right um, there's lots of different ways that it can be triggered which we'll talk about a little bit later now this vomiting center is um, triggering a really complex and very obviously coordinated chain of events so the first part is um, the relaxation of smooth muscle in your stomach and your small intestine, which slows down, um, the, I guess, the passage of food or chyme through your um, digestive system. Then the smooth muscle begins retrograde contraction, so essentially reverse peristalsis, so it's propelling those contents up into the stomach um, and refilling it, so going in the opposite direction than we would normally expect. Uh, at the same time, we get these uh, our abdominal skeletal muscles and our diaphragm muscle will contract quite violently to increase that intra-abdominal pressure and of course the um, upper and lower esophageal sphincters have to relax. Um, the epiglottis that's covering the glottis has to close to protect the airway. Um, the soft palate lifts itself which essentially is trying to protect your nasopharynx from the contents of your, of, um, your stomach. Um, and you also get this excessive salivation which might be to protect your mouth from that excessive um, acid in your, in your gastric contents as it passes through. You'll get tachycardia, which uh, they think might have something to do with increasing your oxygen supply to your tissues while that glottis is closed um, and you're not breathing, obviously. And then, yeah, you've got, then you've got this powerful contraction of the diaphragm and the, um, yeah, and we've got that you know, large wave of reverse peristalsis, essentially, bringing things from the duodenum up into the stomach and then out through your esophagus and your mouth. So most of it generally will relieve your, your mouth, but depending on how good that closure was with the nasopharynx, you might have a bit of it going through your nose as well. So when you go the whole way, <laughs> we call that vomiting, but nausea is just this first part of the process without that actual triggering of that, um, I guess, the expulsion of, of food. Well, past food. So vomiting can happen in response to a lot of different stimuli. Uh, when you're stressed, when you're emotionally overwhelmed, uh, when you've eaten too much, um, when you've been moving a lot, um, seasickness, for example, uh, when you're in the presence of, like, irritating substances like alcohol, for example, um, alcohol metabolites, certain drugs, um, and of course, bacterial infections. Now, obviously those things are actually quite different, aren't they? So um, your body and your brain has to respond to all these very different stimuli. So um, they're going to have to bring their, their signals to this vomiting center in the brain in a lot of different ways. So we'll have a little bit of a look at the various ways. Now it's important to point out that a lot of these pathways aren't, um, and the receptors involved in these pathways are still being understood. So um, I'm doing my best to cover as many of them as I can. So we'll start with motion sickness, okay? So it has a, 
our, our senses have a really important purpose, right? It's helping us navigate the world around us. Um, and that needs to be a really precise thing. You know, we would actually not function. We'd be in a lot of trouble if we were here, but our body thought we were here. Okay, that actual disconnect um, can have quite drastic con consequences for how we function, right? Uh, if you think that you're grabbing for a fu fruit here, but the fruit's actually there, well, you know, you, you, you can kind of see where I'm going here. So our ability to sense our body position and our balance, that comes from within the inner ear in through this bony structure called the labyrinth. So the labyrinth is made up of lots of different areas, but one of those areas is called the vestibular apparatus or the vestibular system. And when we've got this mismatch between what we see and what we feel or where we are physically, um, all between different kinds of sen sensory input in our ears, then you'll end up with motion sickness, right? So it's this mismatch. So the vestibular apparatus will be sending those signals to the brain, uh, will detect, we'll be detecting it and it'll say, hey, there's a bit of a mismatch here. Uh, and then we'll have processes that will send that a signal to the vomiting center. Uh, and those um, terminals will release acetylcholine and stimulate the muscarinic receptors in the vomiting center. So when the, vo the muscarinic receptors in the vomiting center are stimulated, that's going to cause the vomiting reflex to be triggered, okay? So we also know that if the sensory systems in your ear um, are triggered by a virus, for example, it can trigger that same pathway. Now things in the blood, like a toxin, um, byproducts of alcohol, metabolism, drugs, all of those things can stimulate that feeling of nausea and vomiting as well, right? And they do that through what we call the chemoreceptor trigger zone or the CTZ. Um, and that's located right next to the vomiting center in the medulla. And the chemoreceptor trigger zone is yeah, sitting conveniently just outside the blood brain barrier. Now the blood brain barrier functions to basically keep um, a lot of the circulating substances in the blood out of the brain, right? So if the chemoreceptor trigger zone was just sensing what was in the brain, um, within the blood-brain barrier, it would actually miss a lot of stuff. So it's actually very clever. So because it's sitting outside the blood-brain barrier, um, it's basically sampling what's in your blood, okay? So it's responding to drugs, toxins, you know, neurotransmitters, anything um, that is in that vicinity. Um, it has lots of different receptors on it, so it might be detecting um, dopamine, 5-HT, which is serotonin, um, all of those sorts of things, or directly those drugs directly themselves. So, and also chemotherapy drugs <laughs> will affect the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is kind of, is why it becomes easy to remember. So when that chemoreceptor trigger zone gets um, stimulated, it's going to be um, sending a signal to the vomiting center to initiate that vomiting reflex. Um, and it usually does that by um, by releasing acetylcholine at the vomiting centre, which will stimulate those um, muscarinic receptors in the vom vomiting centre. So, gastric stimuli are very common triggers of vomiting as well. So, um, let's say you've got something, you've digested something and it's a bit dodgy, some dodgy food, right? So we've got these in your digestive tract, we've got lots of different glands, we've got deep pits, they've got lots of different types of cells that serve very different purposes. And one of those types of cells is called an enterochromaffin cell. So the enterochromaffin cells release serotonin in response to those different toxins that it might encounter, uh, which will then stimulate the serotonin receptors on the sensory nerve fibres in that area. And that stimulation of those sensory nerve fibers, so for example the vagus nerve or the splanchnic nerve, will actually then, um, it'll send that sig signal all the way up to the vomiting center. Sometimes it actually sends that signal through the, the chemoreceptor trigger zone down to the vomiting center. But long story short, gastric stimuli will ultimately um, trigger that vomiting center to result in vomiting. All right, so next we come to the more complex one, so the higher center inputs. So 
I mentioned before that nausea can come from things like your emotions, feeling anxious, from pain, from things that you smell. Now we call these things higher centre inputs because I mean ultimately those sensations and those feelings are being processed by these higher cortical areas of the brain, like the surface of the brain essentially, literally higher <laughs> than the other parts of the brain. So that's why we call it these higher centre inputs. So so for example, what I mean what I mean is that like if you're emotionally overwhelmed or if you're in severe pain, or if you smell something really bad or really repulsive or see something really repulsive, um, all of that stuff is going to get sensed by the brain. You know, the higher centers of the brain will be processing that information. Um, and that essentially will then send a signal to the vomiting center in the brain. And that will trigger that vomiting reflex. Uh, a lot of people obviously don't like watching other people vomit. <laughs> as I kind of took, alluded to myself a bit earlier. And this is this actually triggers a sensation called disgust, uh, which is quite beneficial really in terms of evolution. If you see someone is vomiting because they ate a, a certain food, well then I won't touch that food. And often you see these pictures on, these videos on the internet, like um, there'll be a video of a golden retriever. Oh, actually what I'll do, I'll find the video. This will demonstrate my point about why disgust happens and why it can be useful. <laughs> so if you can see that someone has consumed something and then they die, well, you don't want to die. So you then um, feel disgust and then you vomit and you get rid of that potential um, contaminant. So where were we? Um, so there's lots of different emotions that can feed into the, essentially the activation of the vomiting center. Um, so when that happens, you will often get a release of um, things like substance P at the vomiting center, and that will bind to the neurokinin receptor, resulting in vomiting, for example. So um, there are lots of different cranial nerves that might be, for example, taking that information to the vomiting center, or it might be happening directly from the brain. Now, I haven't mentioned this in this diagram, but it's also important to mention that if you have an increased intracranial pressure, that's going to squish <laughs> your vomiting center and your chemoreceptor trigger zone is going to compress it. So that might actually generate vomiting or nausea without actually um, as its own trigger itself. So we know that the common drugs that people use to treat vomiting, they're called antiemetics, and they basically act by blocking the neurotransmitter receptors um, in the medulla to basically prevent those neurons from initiating vomiting. So you can see there are a lot of different receptors in the vomiting center. So antihistamines, um, anti anticholinergics, all of these might have effects on um, the vomiting center and reducing nausea. Um, and some of them, for example, we use things like antihistamines for motion sickness because they will block the histamine receptors in the that are sending inputs to the vesti vestibular system. So it'll have, you know, it'll have this dual action. So that's an important thing to consider. Now, just before we end, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the color of vomit because sometimes that can give us some useful information about the status of the individual. So if your vomit is this bright red color, what well, generally implies that there's probably fresh blood in there, uh, it might be severe bleeding and uh, it might be a medical emergency. So for, for example, an esophageal varicine might have burst. With, if that blood looks more like coffee grinds, that's blood that's actually been partially digested by, well, it's reacted with the acid in your stomach, essentially. So what that might imply is that maybe there's a smaller bleed, maybe there's an ulcer, and um, that's what's happening in that situation. If, you're, if your vomit is green, potentially yellow, that just generally indicates that there is some bile present, and that can happen with prolonged vomiting. And in some situations, you can actually get feculent vom vomiting. So if you've got, for example, a bowel obstruction, which is preventing you from actually um, 
going to the toilet, what that will actually do is that, um, I guess that that waste will eventually build up and you have to vomit it out. So these are things to consider when you look at the colour of vomit of your patients. So that's vomit. That's the vomiting reflex. And thanks for your time.